Okay, hello again. This is chapter two, and in this chapter, we're talking about experimental techniques, anything that has to do with experiments or uh, investigations, practical questions, and so on. So, the first thing we'll talk about is the names of the apparatus that we use in the lab. And the word apparatus just means the objects, the things that we use in the lab. So, this is a basic apparatus and you should know what the name is. Do you know what the name of this is? This is just test tubes. Okay, the test tubes are just used for any chemical reaction that we want to do. What is the name of this? This is a conical flask. If you name it only flask, that's fine, but we usually call it a conical flask. What is this? This is a round bottomed flask. You could also label it as a flask. So this is a flask, but this is a round bottomed flask. The other one was a conical flask. What is the name of this one? <clears throat> this is a beaker, and please notice the spelling of these names. Uh, when you are studying in general, please keep in mind that you learn the spelling of everything. You are expected to write everything in the correct spelling. What are these things coming out of the container? These are called glass rods, and glass rods are used for stirring. If I want to stir the solution, I use a glass rod. I don't call it stirrer, I call it a glass rod. Okay, what is this? You should know that this is a funnel. What about these? Now, this, these are containers used to grind the solid. If I want to grind a solid, I use this. And to grind the solid, you use a mortar and pestle. The container itself is the mortar, and the handle that you use to crush the solid is called the pestle. Okay? What about this? And please don't say it's a lens. It's not a lens. This is a small, round container made of glass. We usually use it just to put a solid in it, or we use it to cover the beakers when we're boiling a solution. So this is called a watch glass. A watch glass, when I'm boiling something that evaporates easily, I cover it with a watch glass to prevent the uh, solvent from evaporating. What about this? <clears throat> this? This is called a crucible and lid. A crucible and lid is usually a very small object. Uh, when I'm trying to heat a solid, for example, I'm trying to heat a piece of magnesium, I put it inside the crucible and I cover it and heat it. What about this? This we use if I want to heat a solution, like when we're going to be talking about crystallization, we do crystallization in this. You know what this is called? This is called an evaporating dish. What about this? You should know what this is. This is called a sensitive balance or just balance. But don't call it anything else. So it's called a balance, okay? What about this? Uh, this is used for heating a solution. So this is where you open the gas and allow it to heat the solution. This is called a Bunsen burner, not a heater, okay? It's called a Bunsen burner. What about this? This is a dropper. If I say add three drops of something, then I'm using a dropper. What about this? And notice this is long and thin and it has graduations. If it has graduations, it is called a measuring cylinder because we will be talking about something similar but no graduation. So the one with the graduation is called a measuring cylinder. What about this? Notice that this has two important things. This has a tap and it has graduations. So this is called a burette. Can you see the spelling? Don't write wrong spelling. So this is the burette that we use to add a certain volume of a solution or when we're doing something called titration, we'll be using a burette. What about this? Now this one has no tap, no graduations. It just has a mark on top and we use it to measure the volumes of liquids. But what is the difference between this and the measuring cylinder? So all of these things, we use them to um, measure the volumes of liquid. 
Now, if he says add about 20 centimeter cube, or he says add 20 centimeter cube, not 20.0, 20 then I can use a merging cylinder because the merging cylinder is not that accurate. But then it is a quick method of measurement. So I don't, if I don't care about exactly how much, I use a measuring cylinder. So if he says add quickly something or add something that's not really very accurate, then I use a measuring cylinder because it is fast and quick. But it is not accurate. So it's advantage, it is fast or quick method of adding a solution. A disadvantage is uh, it is not accurate. A burette is accurate, and the burette is the best way to add any uh, solution if you want to know exactly the volume of the solution that you're adding, and um, you want to be exact. And um, for example, when we're doing titration, we'll be using a burette. So I can use it for any volumes. If I want to add 20.0, 20.1, 20 22.3, 20 25.6, whatever, volume I can use this to add it accurately so this is an accurate method so the burette is an accurate method this one is also accurate it is called a pipette it has no tap no graduation but it has a certain mark on the top so when it says that this is supposed to measure 25 centimeter cube then if I fill it to this mark then it is exactly 25.0 but I cannot use it to measure, for example, 20 centimeter cube. There is no mark for 20 or 18 or 17. It, it adds specific volumes of liquids accurately. Okay? So let's see a typical question at this point. What would you be asked about in this uh, chapter? So this is a typical question. The diagram shows liquid in a burette and in a measuring cylinder. Which row shows the readings from the burette and the measuring cylinder? You should be able to read the readings of each of these. Uh, the burette, you have to notice that the burette, the numbers are from up to down. So you have 27 and then 28 and then 29. So when you are reading a burette, you read it from the top. So this is actually 27 point something. Can you see that? So this is 27.8. Can you see? A burette. Or normally, you read from the small number to the big number. So this is 27.8. Now, the measuring cylinder, also from the small number to the big number, but here the small number is at the bottom. So this is... 10, 20, 30, 40, this is 40 point something. So this is 40 what? This is 40, and then you have 50, and you have five lines in there. So each line is for two, so 42, 44. So this is 44 in the measuring cylinder. Can you see that? So your answer is which one? So your answer is 27.8 and 44. So that is B, okay? This is another typical question in an experiment. A student needs to measure out what? 36.50. That means very exact. So which piece of apparatus? Point something something means it is an exact, accurate uh, measurement. So which piece of apparatus would measure this volume most accurately? We said, of course, that the one that would measure volumes accurately is the burette. So your answer is B. Remember that you never use a beaker to measure volume. You use a beaker if you're trying to add a solution to another solution and doing a reaction and so on. You can do that in a beaker. But you never say I use the beaker to measure a volume. It's not a, an accurate method of me measuring volumes at all. Okay. What is this called? Let's go back to the names of the apparatus. What is this apparatus called? This is the one where you put the beaker on top and then you heat it from the bottom. This is called a tripod stand. Some people call it tripod alone, but it actually it is called tripod stand. Okay? And uh, usually it is drawn with the two legs as, I, as it is drawn on the right side. Okay. Now, we have the burette, so we know what's the burette. The burette is the one with the tap, so that's the burette. 
But what is that thing to which it is attached that is standing long? That's the stand, the one that is holding the burette so that it is upright, that is the stand. What is this? You should know this is a thermometer. Again, please note the spelling. So let's see a, a question on thermometers. This is a typical question. It says the boiling point of liquid X is lower than that of water. To test a student, a teacher covers up the numbers on a thermometer. The student places the thermometer in boiling liquid. The diagram represents part of the stem of this thermometer. What could the temperature on the thermometer be? Can you see where the mercury is? Now, where is the end of the mercury on the right? The end of the mercury on the right is something... So we don't know if that is 60 or 70 or 100 or whatever. Um, and he says at the top, did you notice the first sentence? He says at the top, the boiling point of the liquid is lower than that of water. Do you know what's the boiling point of water? You should know that the boiling point of water is 100 degrees. So he's saying, first of all, our answer should be lower than 100. So. C and D are wrong. Are we agreed on that? So C and D are wrong. Why? Because he said the boiling point at the top, he said the boiling point is lower than that of water. So it cannot be 100 and something. So it has to be A or B. Now, is it A or B? So that means it could be 70 something or 80 something. But that something has to be 5.5. Can you see that? The end of the mercury is at 5.5. The end of the mercury here is at 5.5. So it is something 5.5. So that my answer would be 75.5. Do we understand that? Okay, let's go back to the names of the apparatus. So what's the name of this? This is something made of metal that I use to take solids out of a container. So if I say you add... Uh, a small amount of a certain solid, I use this. This is called a spatula. And remember that the spatula is made of metal, so you never use it to stir a solution because the solution would probably contain an acid that would react with the metal of the spatula. So when we stir a solution, what do we say we use? To stir a solution, we use a glass rod, not a spatula. Okay, what is this? This is a gas syringe. A gas syringe is used to collect gases and measure its exact volume. So if I have a reaction that is giving out a gas, I collect it in the gas syringe and I can exactly get the volume of the um, gas that is collected. Okay, so let's take a look at how you read a gas syringe. So here he's saying the volume of carbon dioxide produced was measured every minute for six minutes, whatever. Use the gas syringe diagrams to complete the table of results. Can you read this? You should be able to read this. So at time zero, what is the volume of gas? At time zero, can you see that the gas syringe hasn't moved at all? So at time zero, my volume of gas is zero. Now at time one minute, what is the volume there at time one minute? Can you read it? It's clearly 60. Can you see that? What about at two minutes? At two minutes, it's 60 something. Can you see it is 60 what? So that is 68. So you should be able to read volumes from a gas syringe. Now, what is this called? This is a metal. It looks like a scissors, but it's not a scissors. It's just used to pick up something that is hot, like picking up a crucible that is hot or an evaporating dish that is hot. This is called tongs, okay? This one is a different one. This is used to uh, hold a test tube. So it is actually called a test tube holder. Okay, so we use it to hold a test tube, especially when it is hot. Okay, what is this? We will be talking about this when we talk about something called distillation. So this is called a condenser. So the condenser attaches to the flask and so on, and we use it for, for, for distillation, and we will talk about distillation later. Now, what is this called? This is just a tube that goes from one container to another, so we call it a delivery tube. So the delivery tube, for example, is the one that's carrying the gas from the flask to the test tube, for example. Okay, what is this? 
This is something similar to the maturing cylinder, but it has no graduations. Please notice, it is used in conditions that it looks like a maturing cylinder. But if it has no graduations, it is called a gas jar. What is this? These are things that you put on the flask. If you want to add a liquid to a flask, you either use a thistle funnel, which doesn't have a tap. Notice that both of them do not have any graduations. One of them has no tap, so this is called a thistle funnel. The other one has a tap, but notice it has a tap, but no graduation, so don't mix it up with a burette. It's not a burette because it doesn't have any graduations. It has only a tap, so it is called a dropping funnel. So we put it on top of the flask when we're trying to add uh, acid, for example, to the flask. So you have the dropping funnel on the flask. You're trying to add a liquid to the solution in the flask. You use a dropping funnel. Remember, if it has a tap, it's a dropping funnel. No tap, it is called what? It's called thistle fun. Good. What's this called? This is the one that was holding the burette or we use it to hold any uh, apparatus in the lab. This is called a clamp. Okay. Now, what about the object on which I have the flask? So, I put the flask on what? And then on the tripod stand, it is put on a wire gauze. Can you see the wire gauze? That's the one right below the flask. Okay. What is this? This is called a U-tube. A U-tube usually contains, usually contains a drying agent. So sometimes we put something called anhydrous calcium chloride inside this U-tube. And this is to dry the gas. So if I have a gas coming out from uh, a flask on the left, it, the gas passes through the anhydrous calcium chloride in the U-tube. This is to dry the gas or to remove water. Okay. So, let's try naming these apparatus. So, what is A? Remember, A has no graduations and it has a tap. No graduations and tap, it is called dropping funnel. What is B? B is a flask. If you want to say conical flask, that's fine. Where is C? What is C? C is something that looks like a measuring cylinder, but it has no graduation, so it is called a gas jar. What is D? B is a delivery tube. Okay, let's try another question. The diagram shows the apparatus used to prepare a dry sample of a gas. The gas is more dense than air. Let's just pass this for a moment. What is the name of this uh, first apparatus on the left? But also, it has no graduations. It has a tap. It is called a dropping funnel. And the one on the right on top, Looks like a measuring cylinder, no graduations, it is a gas jar. What about that thing? It's a delivery tube. Can you see that? Okay, let's try again. What is this? This is something that you add, use it to add a liquid to the flask. It has no graduations, no tap, it is vessel funnel. What about this one? It's a flask. What, if you want to say round bottom flask, that's fine. What about that? That is called a wire gauze. What about this one? Do you remember the name of this one that we used to heat the solution? That's called the Bunsen burner. What about this? This is the one with three legs. That is called a tripod stand. What about this one? That's a delivery tube. And this one, no graduations. It's a gas tube. If it had graduations, I would say measuring cylinder. What about that one at the bottom? That's a trough. It looks like a beaker. The beaker, when it is very wide like this, we call it a trough. If you label it a beaker, it will be okay also. But actually, this wide beaker is called a trough. Okay, another typical question. A student measures the time taken for 2 grams of magnesium to dissolve in 50 centimeter cube of dilute sulfuric acid. Which apparatus is essential to complete the experiment? So the two grams of magnesium. Uh, first of all, he wants to measure the time. Measuring the time will need a stop clock. So I need number one. And then I want to measure two grams of magnesium. So I need to use a balance. 
and I need to dissolve it in 50 centimeter cubed of dilute sulfuric acid so I need a measuring cylinder because he didn't say 50.0 so obviously he doesn't need it very accurate so I can use a measuring cylinder do I need a thermometer for any of this no I didn't measure any temperature anywhere so actually I need one two and four so my answer is what about this other question? A student is asked to measure the time taken also. To measure the time taken, I need, I need a clock. For 4 grams of magnesium, 4 grams, I need a balance of magnesium carbonate to react completely with 25.0 of dilute hydrochloric 25.0 means I need uh, something that is accurate. So, so far, I need a clock and... I need a balance and I need something that will measure 25.0 accurately. So which pieces does the student need? So he would need a pipette to measure 25 and the clock and the balance. So my answer is also A. Can you understand how to think about these questions? Okay, this is another question. A small piece of limestone is heated strongly and left to cool. A few drops of cold water were added. The solid expanded. Ignore all of this. Now he's saying complete the empty boxes. So that box on the left at the top, what is that called? That's that thing that's coming out of the stand. It is called a clamp. What about the one below it? The one below it is used to heat something. We, oh, sorry, okay, the other one. So the other one that I'm using to add drops is the dropper and then the Bunsen burner that I'm using to heat, okay? Uh, another typical question. Let's try this together. A student takes 2 gram samples of calcium carbonate and adds them to 20 centimeter cubed samples of dilute hydrochloric acid at different temperatures. She measures how long it takes for the effervescence to stop. So she's measuring 2 grams. Does she need a balance? Yes. So D is wrong. Um, adds them to 20 centimeter cubed. 20 centimeter cubed, I would need what to measure 20 centimeter cubed? I would need the measuring cylinder. So my answer is still A, B, C, A or B or C. Um, at different temperatures. So do I need a thermometer? Yes, so that eliminates answer A, right? Um, she measures how long it takes. How long it takes, that means I need a clock. So that means I need a balance and a clock, and a measuring cylinder, and a thermometer, but I don't need this funnel, right? So my answer is B. Do you understand that? This type of questions, you, you choose A if everything in A is correct, or you choose B if everything in B is correct, and so on, so our answer is B. Another typical question, a student carries out an experiment to find out how fast. How fast means you're measuring time, so you need a clock. How fast? 3 cm pieces of magnesium ribbon dissolve in 10 cm cubed samples of sulfuric acid. So you need a measuring cylinder to measure the 10 cm cubed. At different temperatures, that means you would need a thermometer. Now, which piece of apparatus does the student not need? So how fast? He needed the clock. And he needed the measuring cylinder. And he needed the... A thermometer so what he didn't need was the balance okay so let's start talking about important safety precautions in the laboratory in some questions he will ask you suggest a safety precaution well if he says suggest a safety precaution then the first thing you do is go back and see what was he using so if he was using something that is flammable for example, ethanol. If I'm trying to heat ethanol, I cannot put it directly on an open flame because it's flammable. You understand the meaning of the word flammable? Flammable means it can catch fire. So if I heat it, I heat it like this in a beaker containing hot water. This is called a hot water bath. So the test tube contains ethanol. Test tube contains something that is flammable. I don't put the test tube directly on the Bunsen burner, it will catch fire. So I need to heat it in a hot water bath. That means I get a beaker, put some water in it, and I put the test tube inside this water. This is called a hot water bath. It is important that you do not put the ethanol near an open flame or it will catch fire. 
okay, if we're not talking about something that's flammable, then I need to think about something else. If we're using gases in our experiment, either as something I'm adding, so I'm adding a gas to my experiment, or the experiment itself is giving out a gas, then I have to tell him, do the experiment in a fume cupboard. This is called a fume cupboard. A fume cupboard is something in, at the back of the lab, you probably have it at the back of your lab, and it has a cover that I can uh, pull up or down so that I can do the experiment inside the fume cupboard without um, smelling the gases that are coming out. Okay, so if the experiment involves something that is flammable, I tell him to um, heat in hot water bath or do not expose the solution to an open flame. If I'm using gases, I tell him do the experiment in a fume cupboard. What if I'm not doing any of this? Then I have something that is hot, then I tell him hold the hot object with tongs. Remember that we said this is called what? This is called the crucible. It is hot, I heated something in it, so I need to hold it. I hold it with tongs to avoid burning your hand. Or if there is nothing else that he's saying that in the experiment, then I just say wear safety glasses to avoid splashes in the eyes or wear gloves when handling corrosive substances. So if we're using acids or bases in our experiment, we tell him wear gloves, okay? Sometimes he says, um, so just a method to improve the accuracy of the results. So I'm measuring something and he wants you, okay, I want to measure it more accurately. So what should I do? Usually I tell him repeat each reading three times and obtain the average. So if I'm re reading, uh, um, I'm doing titration, for example, I'm trying to read the volume of the solution from the burette, I tell him repeat the experiment three times and obtain the average. Why? Because the average is more accurate. If uh, I don't want to say that, I look at what he's using to measure volumes. If he told me that he measured for example, the volume of the liquid using a measuring cylinder, then I will tell him, no, don't use a measuring cylinder. You should use a burette instead of a measuring cylinder because the burette is more accurate. Okay, what if he's measuring the volume of gases? If he's measuring an experiment, is giving out a gas and he's measuring the volume of the gas, then I say use a gas syringe if he's using something else other than the gas syringe because the gas syringe will measure the volume of the gas accurately. Okay, what if he's trying to dry a solid? How do we dry a solid? If I have uh, crystals or something that I collected or something that I prepared and I want to dry it, I tell him dry between filter papers. I never tell him dry in an oven because the oven will probably cause the crystals to break down or decompose. So we say dry any solid that we prefer between filter papers. Or I can say place it in a desiccator. A desiccator is something made of glass and I put my substance in that crucible inside the desiccator and at the bottom of the desiccator there is a drying agent. So something called anhydrous calcium chloride is usually used as a drying agent. A drying agent is something that will absorb any water vapor in the air so it takes up all the water that is present in my solid so it dries it. So usually we say dry between filter papers but if he mentions a desiccator, the desiccator is just this kind of apparatus that I can put my solid in with a drying agent and try to dry it. Okay, remember that we do not heat the crystals in an oven when I'm trying to dry it because this may cause decomposition of the substance or it would cause loss of water of crystallization. You know what's water of crystallization? Sometimes I'm trying to prepare, for example, copper sulfate five water. So these are crystals of copper sulfate that have water in them. This is called water of crystallization. If I heat the crystals, the hydrated crystals in an oven, then this will break it down and it will lose its water of crystallization. Okay, these are called hazard labels. Um, get familiar with them. Usually they don't ask too much about them, but just get used to them. Uh, the important one is the toxic one. Can you see which one is toxic? The one that has a skull on it. 
This means these are labels that are put on the bottles of the chemicals. So if you enter your lab and you look at the bottles of the chemicals, they usually have these labels on them. So if it is something that is toxic, it will have this label with this color on it. If it's something that is flammable, it, can you see the uh, label for flammable? Something like a bottle of ethanol will have this kind of label on it. Or something that's corrosive. Can you see which one is corrosive? Corrosive, the word corrosive means if it uh, falls on your skin, it burns your skin. So any concentrated acid or base, usually acids and bases are corrosive. Just get used to it for any, uh, in case of any questions. Okay, this is, these are now, um, what should we say? They are pre things that you should know about practical questions. So usually, your practical questions are in paper six. You know that when you enter the exam at the end of the year, you have three papers. You have paper two, four, and six. Paper six has to do with um, practical things, with things that uh, are related to experiments. Usually, he will ask you to draw a graph. Now, when he asks you to draw a graph, you plot the points that he tells you, and you're supposed to join these points to form a curve, for example. If you're trying to form a curve and one of the points is away from the curve, that is called an anomalous result. So the anomalous result is the one that does not fit the curve, that is away from the curve. So you're not supposed to include it because if you find that you're trying to include it, then you find that the graph will go in and come out. You can't do that. You have to uh, join it so that it's a smooth curve so you ignore the anomalous result okay okay in tests on solids he will be talking about colors of solids if you remember from previous uh, um, years or we will be talking about it also remember that if a solid is colored it has a transition metal remember that transition metals if you will be talking about it again um, I just collected all the things that have to do with the experiments in this chapter. And then if you don't remember what's a transition metal, I'll tell you. It's uh, something that is forms colored compounds. When we talk about transition metals, we say they form colored compounds. So if I see any compound that is colored, it probably contains a transition metal, or most probably contains a transition metal. Because compounds of anything that are not transition then the solid will be a white solid. So the white solid on the right is something that doesn't have transition metal. So it's probably a compound of group 1 or group 2 or group 3 and so on. Um, if I dissolve it in a solution, it is called a colorless solution. Don't say clear solution. It's not a clear solution. It's a colorless solution. Okay? Okay, when a solid is heated and condensation forms at the top of the tube, usually in paper 6, he will tell you the solid was heated and condensation forms at the top of the condensation means you have uh, drops of, uh, of liquid at the top of the tube. Um, if I do this to a solid, that means that the solid is a hydrated solid. Hydrated solid means it has water of crystallization. So when it ha was forming crystals, it was taking some water molecules with it in the crystal so it's called a hydrated solid keep all of this in mind as we go along we'll go back to them again now if i'm trying to collect a gas how do i collect a gas now there are different methods of collecting a gas if the gas is not soluble in water so if i'm trying to collect oxygen or hydrogen you should know that oxygen is regarded as very slightly soluble in water or for our purposes we will say it's insoluble and hydrogen is something that does not dissolve in water then I can collect it like this so this is a flask that has a reaction in it and the reaction is giving out a gas like oxygen or hydrogen that doesn't dissolve in water then I pass it through the delivery tube and the gas jar originally is filled with water so the gas jar is originally filled with water but as the, the gas bubbles up, it displaces the water. So the water in the gas jar goes down and the gas collects at the top of the gas jar. So this is a method of collecting a gas if the gas does not dissolve in water. 
But if the gas dissolves in water, I cannot use this method. I have to use a different method. Now, if it is lighter than air, and you have to remember that a gas like ammonia is lighter than air, I collect it like this. This is called upward delivery. So the gas jar is inverted, and it originally, of course, contains air. Now, as the ammonia gas collects, it goes up into the gas jar and displaces the air, so the air goes out. So this is called upward delivery. Now, when do we use upward delivery? If the gas I'm collecting is lighter than air or has lower density than air. Now, if the gas is heavier than air or higher density than air, then I collect it like this. And remember that carbon dioxide is a gas heavier than air. This is called collecting by downward delivery. So when I collect it by downward delivery, that is used for a gas that is higher density or heavier than air. If all of these methods, I was collecting the gas, but I wasn't measuring its volume. Now, if he says I want to collect the gas and measure its volume, I have to do it like this, collect it through a gas syringe, and instead a gas syringe will measure the volume of the gas accurately. Now, one source of error in here, can you see the connection between the delivery tube and the gas syringe? If there is a leak in that connection, that will mean that the amount of gas that I collect will be less than what it should be. So keep that in mind as we go along. So let's see a typical question. We've talked about uh, the names of the uh, apparatus in here. That top one with the funnel is the dropping funnel. Uh, the other one on the other side is the gas jar and the one at the bottom is the conical flask. Now, the next question says, identify one mistake. Now, one mistake, I go back to what he said at the top of the question. What did he say at the top of the question? The diagram shows the apparatus used to prepare a gas and he's saying the gas is what? The gas is more dense than air. That means it's heavier than air. So, should I collect it the way he drew it? No. I shouldn't collect it by upward, I should collect it by downward delivery. So the gas should not be collected by upward delivery since it is denser than air. So just the reason why the gas is passed through concentrates of peak acid. This is a typical question that you can have in paper 6. So he is passing the gas through concentrates of peak acid. Remember that if I pass the gas through anything, that is probably to dry the gas or to remove water from the gas. If you say to remove impurities, that would also be okay. Okay, this is another setup where I have uh, liquid on mineral wool and I have something called broken tile. Broken tile is just ceramics, you know, the ceramics that we have on our floors in most of our houses. Okay, now this kind of setup, I'm trying to heat the um, uh, test tube. So I have very strong heat under the test tube, and I have a delivery tube going into water. Now, what if I have finished the experiment? When I finish the experiment, I need to do something very important. I cannot just close the Bunsen burner and leave everything as it is, because if I close the Bunsen burner and leave everything as it is, the air inside the test tube will cool down. When gas cools down, it contracts and becomes less volume, so it will suck up water from the delivery tube. The water will be sucked up into the hot test tube. That will break the hot test tube. So when we do this, the delivery tube must be removed before he heating is stopped. This is to prevent back suction of water into the hot tube, which would break it. Sometimes he will tell you this question in different ways. He will tell you, okay, why does the tube usually break? I would say this is due to back suction of water into the hot tube. Or name a precaution that should be done in this kind of experiment. Then I'll tell him remove the delivery tube to prevent back suction of water into the hot tube. So this is another typical question that you would get in paper 6. Okay. Also, you will find that when you look at paper 6, he uses cotton wool for different purposes in different experiments. So a cotton wool could be used, for example, to hold liquid. So in that experiment where I had the test tube horizontal and I'm trying to put a liquid, he says I have a liquid again. Now, of course, if I just put a liquid into a test tube and then I put it horizontally in that position, the liquid will 
uh, fall off from the test tube. So I don't put it as a liquid, I soak it in mineral wool or cotton wool. This will hold the liquid. So if he says what is the purpose of the mineral wool in this experiment, or sometimes we call it cotton wool or mineral wool, what is the purpose of the mineral wool in this experiment? To hold the liquid. In other experiments, I can put it so that there is no liquid in this second experiment, but there are solids. I have calcium chloride that is in this uh, test tube, and uh, this is supposedly attached to the rest of the experiment, whatever I'm trying to do. So in this case, why do I have a piece of cotton? I have a piece of cotton to prevent any solids from passing through the apparatus. Now, a third use for the cotton wool is to prevent liquids from splashing out. So for example, in that uh, flask on the right, I have something, for example, that's giving out a gas. Now, I want the gas to go out, so I cannot close it with a bung. We call it a bung if I'm trying to close the test tube complete, uh, the flask completely. And at the same time, I cannot leave it completely open to the air because when a gas is coming out, that means that the liquid is bubbling over and that means that some of the liquid may splash out and I don't want that. So if he says, why do I have a cotton wool at the mouth of that flask, that is to prevent loss of liquid by splash. Keep all of this in mind and then when we take questions that are talking about paper 6, you will be uh, uh, requiring some of these information. Okay, a suction pump. Can you see where the suction pump is? A suction pump is um, used to suck gases through an apparatus. So for example, I'm burning uh, a fuel in that container and I have an inverted funnel on top of the fuel because I want to collect the gas that is coming out of the burning. So I, I need this gases coming out from the burning of the fuel to go through the delivery tube and into the liquid that is in that test tube. So I use a suction pump to suck up these gases to make sure that these gases go up and they're not lost to the air. Are we following? Okay. In some experiments, you'll see something called an airlock. Now, what's an airlock? An airlock is that kind of bent tube on the mouth of the flask or the container. Now, why am I using the airlock? The airlock is a bent tube containing some water. Now, I use this, for example, in fermentation. If you remember what is fermentation, fermentation means I have inside that flask, I have yeast and the glucose and so on, and it is trying to give out carbon dioxide gas, or a gas is supposed to come out. So I want, again, I want the gas to come out, but I don't want any oxygen to go in, because fermentation, for example, is an experiment that is done without oxygen. It's called anaerobic, without oxygen. So I don't want any air or oxygen to go in, but at the same time, I cannot lock it up on the mouth of the flask because I want the gas to come out. So the air lock is uh, an apparatus that allows the gases to go out but prevents oxygen or air from entry. Okay. In an experiment, usually you will measure temperature. Temperature at the beginning will be the room temperature, and then it will either increase or decrease. So when we talk about some endothermic reactions or exothermic reactions, if you remember what that is, in an endothermic reaction, the temperature goes down. So I'm starting at room temperature, for example, and the experiment is going on, so the temperature goes down. But what if I leave this experiment and come back one hour later, what will happen to the temperature? The reaction has finished, so the temperature is no longer going down, and then it will start to go up until it goes back to what it originally was, so it returns back to room temperature. So whether the experiment has the temperature, during the experiment, the temperature goes down or the temperature goes up, if I leave it and I come back after an hour or I come back the following day, I will find that it has returned to room temperature. Why? Because the experiment has finished, so it returns to room temperature. Okay, um, so after some time, the temperature of the experiment returns back to the original room temperature. This is because the reaction has finished. 
Okay, this is another thing that you need to know that when we're doing an experiment involving measure, measurement of temperature, so I'm doing an experiment which is exothermic or endothermic again, so it's an experiment that becomes hotter or becomes colder, and I'm trying to follow the change in temperature using a thermometer. Now, usually we don't do this kind of experiment in something like a beaker or a test tube. We have to do it in something called a polystyrene cup. The polystyrene cup is basically a plastic cup, uh, something similar to the cup that uh, when you go and buy coffee, for example, from Starbucks or from a store that sells coffee, he will give you the coffee in a polystyrene cup. Now, why is he doing that? Why doesn't he give it to you in a glass cup, for example? This is to prevent loss of heat to the environment. So I don't want the heat to be lost to the environment then the temperature I will be measuring the thermometer will not be accurate. Okay, another thing, usually in some experiments in paper 6 again, he will tell you to read a stopwatch. So the stopwatch basically looks like this. So it is something that has an inner circle and he will usually label that the inner circle is minutes and the outer circle is seconds. So the minutes is how many minutes? The minutes, for example, is on 1. So this is 1 minute one minute and how many seconds this is what this is 15 okay um, it's before 30 by about 4 so this is uh, 26 so that means that this is one minute and 26 seconds usually he will ask you to write the uh, time in seconds so you should change all of this to seconds you know that one minute is 60 seconds plus 26 then this is sorry this is 86 seconds okay now, these are um, uh, terms that we use to describe readings that you get. So, your reading, whatever your reading, is either reliable or valid or accurate or with precision or an anomalous result. Okay? So, if I say that my reading is reliable, that means that if I repeat it every time, I will get the same result. So, I'm measuring volumes from a burette, for example. Reliable, that means I, if it's repeated, it gives the same result. But it may be reliable, but not valid. The valid is something that is measuring what it is intended to measure. So, I'm, I'm measuring, I don't know, volume of burette. Um, I don't say it is 2 grams, for example, or something. So, a valid reading is something that measures what is intended. An accurate reading is what I'm supposed to get. So, if I use an accurate instrument, so, for example, I'm measuring the volume of a certain liquid. Um, if I measure it in a burette instead of a measuring cylinder, then that's an accurate reading. Now, precision means I get the same reading under the same conditions. So I'm repeating the same conditions, I'm getting the same readings. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they are valid. Do you understand the difference? Now, anomalous result is something that's wrong. It's a wrong result. I measured something and something went wrong with it. So the measurement is wrong and that means it doesn't fit the curve. So when we were drawing the curve, the anomalous result is one that does not fit. it. Okay, so this is the end of chapter 2. I want you to, now you're supposed to go back to your PDF notes and study this chapter in the PDF notes and then go back to the PDF chapterized questions and try and do all the questions on that chapter and then you go to the next video to see the correct answers for these questions. Okay.